Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we're going to do part two of our conversation with Dan Meek and Lloyd Marbet. Dan, of course, is the uh, advocate for campaign finance reform. He's a uh, public interest attorney here in Portland. Lloyd Marbat has been active uh, on environmental issues, particularly with regard to uh, nuclear power, but also has had a long-standing concern about money and politics. And so welcome back to the show, both of you. Thank you. All right, yeah, so I think last time when we, when we stopped talking, we were we were talking about the initiative process and how in Oregon the Secretary of State has put a lot of requirements uh, uh, in order to in invalidate order to signatures. Difficult. Right, okay. Actually, yeah. I think what, what we ought to talk about now is uh, something that Dan told me after the last show, which was about the uh, election of a new mayor in Seattle and how this man did it, because I think it demonstrates why it is that we need campaign finance reform. All right. Dan. Well, of course, um, we're probably we're not going to get campaign finance reform uh, or limits on contributions in Oregon, except by the initiative process, because you know the legislature, Oregon legislature, has never adopted limits on on contributions. And to uh, comparison, with comparison with Washington here is very useful. In in Oregon, the Secretary of State is disqualifying about 45 percent of all signatures, 50 percent on some measures. In the state of Washington, the validity rate on signatures on statewide measures has been consistently averaged 80, 85 percent. God, that's amazing. Now, why is it that uh, the invalidity rate in Washington is 15 percent and the invalidity rate here is 45 percent, which is three times higher? Is there three times higher more fraud in Oregon? No. There's just that much more um, technical requirements that don't really, that don't correspond to, you know, to having valid which, voter signatures. To remind the audience, you know, all these funny ways in which the Secretary of State says that, you know, because you you began to print your name instead of, and you crossed it out, that's a fraud, or the date, you know, you changed the date or whatnot, you know, and, and of course the big problem is, is that each of the signatures that's on a signature sheet can be verified unto itself as to whether or not it represents a, a valid registered voter. Mm -hmm. Because a signature gatherer might make some mistakes in signing the, 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 uh, the signature gatherer certificate should have nothing to do with the sovereignty of the or, or the right of the voter that signed the petition. But anyway, right. that's mm -hmm. just a kind of a sure. rehash of what we and, went through the last time. Mm -hmm. and, um, I got a call the other day, a couple of weeks ago, from uh, the mayor of Seattle, who was, I worked back in Congress in the mid-1980s uh, as the staff director of a congressional committee. The chairman was Jim Weaver from Oregon. And, um, and this person, Mike McGinn, was a, just a 23-year-old intern, started out and then assistant in, in uh, Weaver's office. Um, and so it turns out now he's the mayor of Seattle. Hmm. And he was uh, elected in 2009. Um, he spent a grand total on his campaign. He had no paid staff whatsoever, and he spent a grand total of $150,000 on his campaign. That is what he what he took in in contributions and, and expended. Now, what did Charlie Hale spend on his campaign? About $1.4 million. Wow. And, and you know, Portland contrast. is a much bigger city. I mean, no, <laughs> it's a smaller city. <laughs> and um, of course, Jefferson Smith also spent nearly a million dollars, and Eileen Brady spent $1.1 $1 million. So. You're looking at a race in Oregon, a mayor's race that spent at least three, three and a half million dollars. In Seattle, uh, Mike McGinn was outspent about three to one or so, but the, I mean, he only spent 150,000 and had no paid staff. Washington has limits on political contributions. Um, they're, they're fairly high limits, like $600 per individual. Um, but that illustrates the fact that in Washington, you can, the largest city in Washington did elect a truly progressive mayor uh, his main issues are uh, transportation, that is getting uh, more bicycles on the street, more light rail, um, and also um, stopping the coal trains from uh, stopping the export of coal from Washington ports because all of those coal trains, of course, w want to take, they're very heavily loaded, they want to take the, the least mountainous course, the, the most flat course, and the most flat course through Washington goes straight through downtown Seattle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what you can get with when you've got campaign finance reform. You can get actually you can actually elect progressive folks who aren't beholden to the uh, economic interests that fund their campaigns. Mm -hmm. You okay. mentioned that uh, this this new mayor is uh, opposed to the coal exports. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, when you look at the whole issue of global warming, the, the roadblock is not the science. The roadblock is the political process, mm -hmm. which, which basically manipulates the science or denies the opportunity for the science to be fairly evaluated. And all, you know, I've, I've made this point many times on campaign finance reform. It's the, it's the number one issue. It's always the number one issue because it controls all the other issues. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. So, so let's just talk about here in Portland. We had a system of public funding of elections, and it was uh, um, thrown out by the voters. Uh, what was it? Two years ago? Four years ago? Um, I forget. About two years ago. It was two about years ago. By about okay. by less than one percent of the vote. Right. So it was you know like around a thousand thousand votes. Uh, is there any prospect now with the new city council that that might uh, come back? No. Fat chance. <laughs> no. Absolutely not. You uh, mean Steve Novick won't Charles, support this? The mayor, new, new mayor, Charles Hales, Charlie Hales, is no advocate of campaign finance reform, and the new council member, Steve Novick, is a definite uh, non-advocate of campaign finance reform. In fact, uh, he, he strenuously opposed our campaign finance reform statewide measures in 2006 and argued at the time that the problem was that there wasn't enough money in political campaigns. We weren't spending enough on political campaigns. Also, public funding... Yeah, he's also been bad on the initiative process, too. Mm -hmm. Very bad. Public funding of, of elections is generally a very unpopular cause. Um, it is unpopular because the opponents can characterize it as, as your, tax, your hard-earned taxpayer dollars going to finance the political campaigns of people you disagree with. Mm -hmm. and. So it's, it's very difficult to pass, to pass that. In polling, it basically uh, public funding of campaigns typically loses two to one. On the other hand, limiting contributions, limiting private contributions, is very popular and generally passes. Um, the problem in Oregon is even if you have a system of public funding, it can be overwhelmed by unlimited private contributions. Mm -hmm. That It's illustrated by the fact that we, ha we do have public funding on the federal level for the presidential campaigns. Right. But of course, both major candidates opted out because they would rather collect and spend 10 times more money from private contributors than to use the public financing mm -hmm. system. The last person who used it was John McCain in 2008 right. when, right. when Obama also opted out of the system so that he it's could raise and spend that. more private money. And of he course, this like year. He did super PACs, and then all of a sudden he wanted one for himself. Uh -huh. and Several. On right. and on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Uh, Let's just talk about this election and election results in terms of what's going to happen at the national level uh -huh. in terms of policies. Well, it looks like um, unlike the last three um, elections in 2006 and 2008 and 2010, this election was not a throw the bums out election. In 2006, the Democrats benefited particularly in Senate races because, and, uh, because the, the um, Republicans were in charge, George W. Bush was in charge, the Democrats had a very good election. 2008, they had a very good election. Right. 2010, because the Democrats were in charge of both the House, of the House, Senate, and the presidency, the Republicans had a good election. And maybe voters are finally coming to the realization that you can't keep throwing the bums out and replacing them with the same bums who were there before. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So voters are finally realizing, okay, well, we didn't like the Democrats, we voted them out. We didn't like the Republicans, we voted them out. Now what? And so we basically end up with the same thing we had before, the same president, essentially the same mix in the Senate. I think the Democrats picked up two seats. Mm -hmm. And essentially the same mix in the House. The Democrats picked up eight seats, but the Republicans still have 54% uh, of the House. So it's basically, in Washington, D.C., it's the same lineup, it's the same lineup like that we had before. Yeah, I think. Um, and so I wouldn't expect anything different yeah. than we had before. With the with the Senate, the Democrats now have a majority, or or they did. Sixty, at least sixty now. Well, no, they have fifty-five. Plus. If you include, oh. if you include, still a majority. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. the two independent. If you include um, Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. caucusing with the Democrats and Angus King of Maine right. now caucusing with the Democrats, they have fifty-five. They had. 53 before, I believe. Okay, all right. But so, it's basically the same yeah. thing. Yeah. So uh, Senator Merkley had led, I think led, or at least participated in a 
effort to get rid of the filibuster um, two years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I did talk with him recently and asked him about that, and he said that he was going to make that attempt again. You see that that might be a possible, um, might we actually get rid of the filibuster this time? Well, his proposal uh, was not to get rid of the filibuster. Uh, his proposal was to allow filibusters, but require them to be, in most cases, to be what are called talking filibusters. That is, uh, uh, the filibuster has evolved in, con in the Senate from what we normally understood it to be in the days of, was, who, was that, who was the guy in that movie, Jefferson Smith? You mean Huey Long, who did no, that? No, the, 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 the movie with, um, with um, was it Gregory Peck or was it Jimmy Stewart? Mr. Oh, Smith Jimmy goes Stewart. to Washington. It was Jimmy Stewart. Oh, it was right. Jimmy Stewart. Anyway, um, when he did his filibuster, of course, he had to he had to stand on the Senate right. uh, on the Senate and floor and talk. filibuster. And I don't sure. know how he how he went to the bathroom or anything. Maybe he had a, a catheter. I don't know. But um, <laughs> but the it, it it has evolved into um, allow the Senate allowing multiple simultaneous filibusters, silent filibusters. That is. Someone just says, okay, I'm filibustering this. All right, let's go on to the next item of business. Okay, I'm filibustering that. Let's go on to the next item of business. You're filibustering that. Right, right. And so it's really the problem it's is not, not a the filibuster. filibuster. It's the multitasking on the floor of the Senate. That is, you can have an infinite number of silent filibusters going on mm -hmm. while, while you go ahead and take care of Senate business. So Merkley's proposal basically is if you want to filibuster, that's it. I mean, you do have to, fil you do have to stand and speak, and uh, other people have to stand and speak. The market and, for catheters is going to go up. And other <laughs> Senate business has to come to a halt. You can't be doing other things uh, while a filibuster is going on. So it's generally a good proposal. I mean, it would be better just to get rid of it entirely. Right. It's generally a good proposal. Uh, it was voted down um, two years ago. Um, the Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid, did not support it. Uh, and Harry Reid has now, over the past several months, said that he would support it. So it remains to be seen whether it will be enacted. Of course, um, the, on the first day of the Senate, the Senate adopts new rules. And uh, there is no rule that says how many votes are required to adopt a new rule. Right. And so you would think it would be 50, it would be 51%. Uh, but of course, the Republicans argue that, oh, no, we're bound by the rules of the old Senate. And the rules of the old Senate say you can't change the rules except with a two-thirds vote. So well, you know, but yeah, I'm, I'm somewhat frustrated by this because it's really a sideshow. I mean, the substantive issues that we need to address are climate change. We need, we need to take a look at the energy mix that we're going to rely on for our future. We need to up the amount of investment that we're making in renewable energy and so forth. These issues aren't going to get discussed the way this is going. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be business as usual for four more years. And the problem, of course, is, is that we, at the same time, continue our buildup of global warming gases in the atmosphere. The longevity of those gases take us far out into the future, and it increases the likelihood that we're going to go far beyond the tipping point that we're already going past. We're already past the tipping point. Mm -hmm. We already have, you know, this runaway melting going on in the Arctic and so forth. I, I uh, do recall during the, I think it was the second debate, the second presidential debate, that um, Obama criticized Mitt Romney for standing in front of a coal plant, a coal-fired power plant, and saying, this plant kills. That is, it was Romney who was opposing the operation of a coal-fired power right. plant. Right. And, he, and Obama criticized him for that. Right. Well, because Obama is pro-coal. He's pro-nuclear. I mean, and pro-coal. pro-everything. Pro you know, so. pro, but, it's, but it's clean coal. That's right. Know, that that's right. Yeah, that's clearly. right. Yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 the unfortunate reality is, is that the political system as it is has basically taken away the opportunity for us to address these problems through the democratic process. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what it's come down to. And so we have these major roadblocks, and the whole beauty of the democratic process supposedly was that we would, a, as, as people, we would be able to address the issues of the day in, in, in a timely fashion. 
There's no timeliness in this anymore. I mean, it's just obstruction after obstruction. It's obstruction in the election process, in the sense that, that, that the right wing can come in with unlimited amounts of income and affect the outcome of elections, putting people in that are not going to be responsive to the, the concerns of the people. I think the people are demonstrating that, that they believe that there's something going wrong here and they want to mm -hmm. do something about it. But I don't think that under the current situation, that we're going to see any yeah, progress. Yeah. yeah, I was very encouraged with uh, the fact that in uh, Colorado and Montana, uh, there were uh, initiatives on the statewide ballots for amending the Constitution to get rid of Citizens United, That's right. at That's least, right. uh, if not the whole idea that money is money is speech. It's, it's, it's such a slow It process. is, but I was very encouraged that Right. Two states did that. Right. Uh, they joined, I think, six states that have already done it by resolution. Uh, every place that had that on the ballot, including four cities or counties here in Oregon, they had similar kinds of measures on the ballot, approved them by over 70 percent. Right. There you Massachusetts go. had it on the ballot in over 100 communities. They were all approved by, on average, 73 percent, as I recall. Of, but in order to get a constitutional amendment, you can't do it that way. That is, you either have to have three quarters of the state's legislators call for a constitutional convention, mm -hmm. uh, which is then open to uh, All kinds prob of probably any issue. Right. Uh, in addition, or you can have Congress, uh, two thirds of each House of Congress have to vote to amend the con to propose an amendment to the right. Constitution which then goes to the state legislatures, it ain't and three-fourths of those have mm -hmm. to approve that. So, um, you know, there are, there are better ways, I think, of getting around Citizens United. One way is, to, uh, is for Congress simply to pass a law, which can be done with a simple majority, if, of course, if you, if you get rid of the filibuster, uh, which is uh, to increase the size of the Supreme Court by two justices. The Supreme Court size has been changed eight times. It's been as few as five, as many as, as I think. I can 10. hear the rights response to this. Well, so what? Yeah, I hear you. Um, that's that's what we you know, that's what we elect supposedly elect the Democrats to do. Right. So put in two more justices. They reverse Citizens United. Done. So, or the court or this the the Congress can simply adopt a, a law that says, oh, the Supreme Court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear any case involving campaign finance reform laws. That's the not court. The court. This the Congress has done that repeatedly in the past. And could do, do you do think it now. this Congress would do it now? I no, mean, seriously, the I'm House saying, is not good. No, no, I know what you're saying. All I'm I saying is, yeah. is there are, are kind of two sets, two different sets of hurdles. Right. One is you can get rid of Citizens United by a simple majority vote of Congress and the signature of the president. Right. Done. Or you can you go, go through this, this huge, huge enormous, right. enormous process right. 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 that uh, would get rid of Citizens United. And mm -hmm. I don't think if you can't do A, you certainly can't do B. So why not try well, A? Why not ask Congress I, I, I A? Think, I think Dan has a point it, it, from this perspective, okay? In the meantime, as this sideshow goes on, the real issues are not getting addressed, and we're heading for cataclysm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really are in many, many ways. And if you, can't, if you can't use the political process to make change, what do you got left? I mean, this is what... Basically, McKibben's proposing. I mean, he's traveling around the country now, talking about you know protesting at at stockholder meetings for the major oil and coal companies. I know the stockholders at these companies are not going to give a crap about what the hell is going outside of the meeting. But it's but that's what we're left to. We're we're just left to these unfortunate um, whole kind of an attempt to raise the issue, hoping that the media pays attention and somehow you educate Congress. To make the change? I don't know. Yeah, yeah uh, unfortunately, you both present a picture where nothing we do can be effective. I know. I understand That's that. I understand that. And I, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking that down. I'm not saying don't do that. Right. I'm saying it has to be done. But what, what bothers me is is that the, the bottom line is, is we've got to make effective change in a timely fashion, mm -hmm. and we're not being allowed to make that change in a timely fashion. Right. That's the, I, I mean, it eats my heart out. It really does, David. Yeah. I just have a hell of a time yeah. with this one. So we need to figure out something that will be effective. Absolutely, like a new revolution, Like maybe. a new revolution, yeah, right. I, I, you know. 
What do we got left? Yeah. I, I hear Texas is talking about seceding. It may not be a bad idea, you know. I mean, hell, it's to let them succeed. Just let them go, you um, know, and and maybe we could have another civil war or something and slow them down. I don't know. Yeah. I think, it's yeah, craziness. No, uh, yeah, it's all craziness, yeah. and I forgive me for going down that path. Yeah, but it seems like I'm being dragged. Down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, get, I guess for myself, you know, I, I, I have obviously been involved with the move to men, the men in the Constitution. Right, yeah. You know, and that is all about uh, activating people to understand what the issues right, are right. Uh, and getting them to move in that direction. Right. But that is not to say that we shouldn't be addressing these other issues at the same time. Yeah, oh, I agree. Uh, but I the agree. question is, how do we do, how do we address those other issues that you bring up in an effective manner that actually gets the policymakers to notice well, and to... I, I think literally what's happening, and forgive me for interrupting, but I think literally what's happening is, is we're creating the only, we're, we're creating the fire under our feet that is going to speed up the process because I think as the system begins and I'm talking about natural systems begin to fail more and more people are going to demand that accountability and hopefully at some point mm -hmm. it comes together in such a way that we cast aside the roadblocks that we've been suffering under mm -hmm. yeah any 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 more thoughts on that well I've sort of evolved from, I you know, started out just suing utilities for cheating ratepayers. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when we win a case in court, the utilities would go to the legislature to have the law changed yeah. retroactively. So that, that got me involved in the legislature. And then I found at the legislature that the only people who are listened to really are people with uh, uh, lots of money to give to campaigns. So that got me, in, me involved in campaign finance reform. Um, since then, um, I've become involved in minor parties. That's one thing that can have a, a, an effect on elections is minor parties, like the Progressive Party of Oregon, the Working Families Party of Oregon, the Indian Pacific Party. Green Party of Oregon, and the Independent Party of Oregon. Um, it looks like the Independent Party of Oregon will now be a major, the Oregon's third major party in the 2014 elections. This is good. Mm. So that is a potential vehicle for folks who do not, who want to run, but who don't want to be beholden to the, the financiers of either of the major parties yeah. to run and maybe have a chance to win. Okay, so what, what, what's the benefit of, for the independent party being considered a major party? Well, what, what difference does that make? The difference it makes is that the, um, it will, in the primary election in May of 2014, instead of people, only Republicans getting the Republican ballot and Democrats getting the Democratic ballot, Members of the independent party will get the independent party ballot, and we can also, the party can also. Are they going to get a paper ballot? This oh, is yeah. going to be different than the way the the independent party had their oh, yeah. online primary. Absolutely. Wow. This this is a this is a major party on the same. I didn't know that. It would be a major party on the same plane as the Democrats and Republicans, and it could also open its primary to not to let me finish, to non-affiliated voters, so that oh, there would yes. be a. Approximate, probably 600,000 people would be eligible to vote in the Independent Party primary, which is just slightly below the number who would be eligible to vote in the Republican primary. Oh, this primary. is good. This is good. I and mean, there is it, a it's, another, it's another sideshow, but it's good. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, with um, the Independent Party has had a, a, a litmus test that if you don't support campaign finance reform and limits on political contributions, you don't get the nomination. Now, if you're a major party, you can no longer have that litmus test because anyone can anyone who's a member can sign up to run in your primary. Right. So it means that um, uh, it means that. So the independent party controls their primary in such a way that if you don't bring certain values in, you don't get to be a candidate. Currently, yes, but if it's a major party, no. I see. Hmm. I see. Oh, so you're going to lose that. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And so it's, it's just going to be up to the voters, the members of the party, and the non-affiliated voters to decide who the nominees are. Oh, how interesting. Um, and that will be, I think it will be interesting to have an actual third major party in the state. Hmm. So are, are they in an active campaign to identify po potential candidates? Um, not yet. Not yet, but is they that, that, means all plat that means all offices in the state of Oregon are going to be open for independent party candidates. All partisan offices. Partisan office. Well, if meaning partisan office like uh, House, governor, Senate, oh, yeah. governor. 
all Got the it. House seats, Senate seats, Governor, Secretary of State, Attorney General. Wow. Um, wow. And some city councils are partisan. So and it, some county commissions. Are so partisan. there'll be people that will partisan. come down to the to the. Well, first of all, you have to register as an independent, and then you have to go down to the you know, sign up for candidacy for a particular office, and then at that point, you're part of the primary. Mm -hmm. Okay, there. all right, so I'm gonna do what I did with the last program and tell you the time is up. <laughs> 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 we got there again. Actually, it's not a bad place to leave uh, it. No, no. It, it's so, not a bad place right. to leave so it. So we'll get you both on again sometime in the future. Oh, this would be wonderful, <laughs> right, sure. Okay. Yeah, it's right, always good. an honor to all be right, with good. both of you. Good, thank you, Lloyd. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and Dan, thank, thank you. you. Okay, good. Brother me. Okay. For the show. <laughs> For the sake of the show. <laughs> okay. So we've been talking with Lloyd Marbet uh, and Dan Meek about campaign finance reform and uh, results from the expected results or non-results from the uh, most recent election. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, that concludes our program for today. If you uh, missed an episode of Pipe Plus Dialogues, you know that they are now on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com. Uh, search for Populous Dialogues, click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon uh, to view our shows all of this year and to subscribe to the series. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to uh, end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more about the Alliance for Democracy at the Alliance for Democracy national website, thealliancefordemocracy.org, or our Portland website at afd-pdx.org and um, I want to thank our crew today for being here and getting us on the air so that's Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Janet Morris, Tom Thomas and Beth Kerwin thanks for being here thank you for audience for watching we hope we'll see you again next week thank you bye <laughs>